So should we start? Hello? Yeah, sure we can start. Yeah. You can put your uh, camera on if you want to. Good evening everybody, welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 14J, which is Hematology, General and Fundamental. And we are streaming live from Suraksha Diagnostics, Kolkata. A very, very pertinent and very interesting topic, flow cytometry, principles and technique. And today it is session one, which will be on instrument, dynamics, mechanics, calibration, and the most important, the quality control. To talk on that, we have an expert person who is Dr. Gautam Gopal Bhagwat. He is an MBBS MD from R.D. Gardhi Medical College of Jain, a PDF in Laboratory Hematology, Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. He is presently the consultant hematopathologist at the famous Suraksha Diagnostics, Kolkata. Also the section director of hematology, hematology and flow cytometry at Suraksha. Dr. <coughs> Gautam has been specially trained and has acquired organized and structured hematopathology reporting skills and foundational knowledge to improve patient care. He also had a one month hands on training at the University of Salamanca, Spain, where he gained experience in flow cytometric analysis at various and MRD analysis. In 2019, he received the Berend Hauven Travel Award at the annual conference of the ISLH in Vancouver, Canada. He has completed his MBBS, MD, from RD Medical College, Ujjain. His areas of interest is hemato-oncology and flow cytometry. So you can understand he is the right person to talk on flow cytometry. So without, uh, before I ask him to start, let me request all of you to please keep your camera off. <coughs> and please don't share your screen. With this. Let me request uh, Dr. Bhagwat, sir, please start. Yeah, uh, I'll just share my screen. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah, perfectly fine. Please yeah. start. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I hope everybody is safe. And uh, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Nadeem for giving me this opportunity to talk on flow cytometry principles and techniques. Over the uh, next 60 to 70 minutes, I would go through uh, basically what the flow cytometry machine is, what we as doctors and technicians do with it. What is the importance of quality control? And I have kept this talk very basic as it is for the residents and the students uh, per se. So uh, I would not go much into the complicated things of it. And uh, I'll just keep it to a uh, basic. I'm sure everybody knows these two people, um, great personalities, Anton von Leeuwenhoek and Romanovsky. So we uh, look into the microscope, into the slides, do a peripheral blood smear examination, do bone marrow, a morphology, give our diagnosis because of these two stalwarts who gave us the microscope and the staining uh, because of which we see the cells, classify them. But today we are going to talk about these two people who gave us something with which we could sort cells. So what does a flow cytometer really does? It sorts cell, it classifies cell. I need not tell you the importance or the contributions given by Wallace H. Coulter, but the other person, Leonard Herzenberg, is one who made the first prototype of a fluorescence activated cell sorter, the FACS, and he actually took a loan to set up his uh, entire lab, but he gave a instrument which is an integral integral part of a hematopathology lab at least in today's scenario 
So I cannot imagine a lab without a flow cytometer, a hematopathology lab, because if you ask any PG student or a new resident, what does a flow cytometer does? It diagnoses leukemia and lymphoma. So a diagnosis of leukemia and lymphoma, which is the core of hematopathology, cannot be possible because of flow cytometers. What is flow cytometry actually? So it is composed of three words, flow, cyto and metry. So flow means fluid, cyto is it. So flow cytometry measures the properties of cell as they flow in a fluid suspension across an illuminated light path. So are we using flow cytometric techniques in our lab? So for PGs it might be, we don't have flow cytometers in our lab. But I will make this point very clear, the very basic instrument that we are using a cell counter in which we do our routine CBC is based on flow cytometry. I am sure you know what this is. These are programs which help us in giving out uh, the RBC counts, the MCV or the differential WBC counts. Along with that, we have something called as the scatter grams. Now all these whether it may be due to impedance or whether it may be due to some physical property of the uh, cell, these are based on the flow cytometry technique. That is a cell in uh, measuring the property of a cell in a fluid. So what different are we going to do with a flow cytometer if our cell counters are giving me the properties of the cell? The cell counters, what they are not doing is they are not uh, incorporating an important property of the cell that is the antigenic property. So to check the antigenic property what we do is we do a immunophenotyping. Immunophenotyping the most common that we have in our labs is the IHC or the immunohistochemistry. Oh my, I guess there is some. Yeah, I am audible. Most likely, yes. So, uh, immunophenotyping in our uh, labs is mostly the uh, CD20, CD3 is one of the uh, basic immunophenotyping that is required in our labs. And this uh, is a IHC a photo of a lymph node showing the follicle, follicle which is full of B cells. Now B cell is it has a CD20 over it. So a CD20 follicles, the B cells full of follicles. And what is this? this is, these are all the para follicular areas with the CD3 positive T cell. So this is the immunophenotyping which I guess all of the uh, now have that is the IHC. The other technique for immunophenotyping that we have is something that we rarely see. In fact, I have very rarely seen hardly one of the slides I have seen in my uh, 20 years that uh, after MBBS. And uh, this is a rare but this is another technique of immunophenotyping and most likely this is the glomerular basement membrane uh, stained with some uh, immunofluorescence and so these two are the techniques for immunophenotyping but what we are going to talk in next around 40-45 minutes is this form of the flow cytometry and this antigenic properties I am going to see on this uh, on the softwares on my computer and then I would give a diagnosis. Again, flow cytometry is not only diagnosing uh, leukemia and lymphoma, but surely it is the one of the most important applications of flow cytometry. What is the virtue in a flow cytometry lab? Receive the sample. This sample is processed by my technician, uh, preferably in a biosafety cabinet. This processed sample is put into uh, the flow cytometer. The machine gives me something of these kind of graphs on my computer. 
I analyze these graphs. I play around with the cells. I play around with the graphs, and then give the expression pattern of various antigens. And by my knowledge, of various antigens present in various kinds of leukemia and lymphoma. I report out the immunophenotyping test. So this is the normal flow. Uh, workflow in a flow cytometry laboratory. It has two important components. One is the machine and the human. What does a machine do, or what are the components of the machine? The most important components: fluidics, optics, electronics. These three I will come again and again, again and again. Are the components of the flow cytometry machine which are important? So. as the postgraduate students are uh, uh, also listening to this talk or they are they compose of the majority of the audience of this talk there are certain questions which would come which you would face in your examinations maybe in form of a full notes or the short notes or when you go out of uh, the uh, pg when you pass your pg you will face certain competitive examinations in which there would be multiple choice questions so i think next few slides would be very important because if you are going to appear for any hematopathology a multiple choice question or competitive examinations you are bound to get question from flow cytometry slide to give an insight on what the machine does and what we do while processing the slides the processing the sample so what we do we process it we acquire it and we analyze it so three things that the machine does fluidics optics electronics three things that a technician or a doctor does processing acquire acquisition and analysis now this is the patent that uh, dr coulter had given for his impedance technique and this is one of the older machines that herzenberg's lab at stanford had these are the early sorters and the analyzer these are huge and if you see these are almost covering an entire room with so many buttons so many complicated uh, uh complications in it and so many complicated so many buttons there are various uh, areas where you have to work we are lucky to have compact instruments these are table top instruments in and very less complicated so the life has become easier for us what actually is happening in this machine so flow cytometer is composed of three main components as i told fluidics optics electronics i will keep on repeating this so what is fluidics fluidics held in suspension or bought in single file what is single file that is one cell passes at one time next is the optics a focused laser scatters the light at the interrogation point and either it will scatter the light or emit fluorescence which we collect these collected signals in terms of photons are converted to electrons and then converted to digitalized values that are stored in a file for so as i told this is the fluidics the sample goes in and then the cells come out in a single file one at a time these are interrogated by a stream of laser now the cell is interrogated over here now we have something called as obscuration bar now why this is important because when the cell is not passing through it when this area is empty this laser will continuously hit this detector so there is an obscuration bar which is set at a low angle so any negative light would not go get very less ground noise but when there is a cell at this interrogation point there would be lot of scatter now this cell will scatter light in all possible directions what we do is we capture this all scatters with various pmts now what is a pmt it is a photo multiplier tube not only would it scatter the light in all the directions if there is a fluorescence molecule attached on it it will scatter light of different wavelengths and accordingly we will capture those or detect the photo multiplier tubes these photo multiplier tubes will 
convert this, uh, will send this photons into a ADC that is the analog to digital converter. These analog signals are converted into a digitalized signals and they are sent to a computer or the analysis workstation. So this area is, this entire is the optics and electronics. Now this is the heart of the cell. Now this area is known as the flow cell where the cells go into a single file. Now how does this happen? This is because of the hydrodynamic focusing. Once the sample is injected into the stream of sheath fluid within the flow chamber, they are forced into the core stream. So the sheath from outside is a pressurized and the sample goes through this under pressure in a single file. And here where the nozzle becomes very less diameter, you have a single cell passing one at a time in a single file. Because of the laminar flow, there is no mixing of this sheath and sample. So ideally, only one cell particle should pass through the given point of time and this is the purpose of fluidics. Optics consist of lasers. Argon laser is the most commonly used laser which is a blue uh, light source. There are other lasers also such as the uh, helium neon laser or a helium neon cadmium or the ultraviolet lasers but the most commonly used I will keep this basic and the most commonly used laser is a blue laser which is the argon laser. Next are the filters, mirrors, I will uh, come to what those are and last are the detectors. So this is our optics. Now this is the laser beam. Again these are the cells coming in a single file. This cell scatters the light in all the possible direction. And then we have put these detectors where this scattered light will be detected. So coming on to forward scatter. What is a forward scatter? So when this laser is going in path, a cell comes in between and scatters the light in the forward direction. Now this cell would also scatter light in all the other directions but what we are focusing is the scatter the forward direction which is detected over on this detector. So what happens? If a small cell passes through, there would be a small scatter. If a medium size cell crosses, it would have a medium size scatter and if a large cell crosses, it would have a large scatter and accordingly the voltage is generated and you get a uh, low voltage or low uh, intensity um, graph over here. If on for a medium size, you will get a medium uh, voltage graph and for a large, you will get a large voltage graph. So, now when we see in a peripheral blood smear, what we see is that the neutrophils, uh, the lymphocytes are the smallest cell, Le, uh, neutrophils are uh, more uh, larger than those and the monocytes are the larger cell but once the lysis has been the red cells are lysed we put in the diluents this uh, would change and by volume the neutrophils would be the largest cell the monocytes would be a medium sized cell and the lymphocytes still remains the smallest cell so this is something which I uh, would like to emphasize that under a peripheral smear, maybe the monocyte is the largest cell, but for a flow cytometer, for our routine cell counters, the neutrophil is the largest cell, then comes the monocyte and the smallest is the lymphocyte. I oh, will come to this later. So what exactly happens is, with this scatter, you get something like this. So these are the single parameter histograms single parameter histograms where these are the cells with most size and these are the cells with the least size. Isn't it something like this which you see in your routine three part cell counters. So these are the neutrophils, the monocyte basophils, lymph eosinophils and these are the lymphocytes. So this is a single parameter that is the size that we are taking into consideration and we have classified the cells as neutrophil, mid-sized cells and the lymphocytes. Coming on to the second parameter. So this second parameter is the side scatter. 
so site scatter is based on the cytosol uh, complexity and the granularity of the cell so as you can see here the eosinophils have the most large granules inside basophils also have this granularity but they tend to degranulate and therefore basophils won't have much of a site scatter neutrophils have small fine sand like granules as we, as we uh, describe it and these would have some scatter because of the complexity of the uh, cytoplasm lymphocytes are the most uh, uh, simple cells they are least uh, complex there are no granules and monocyte somewhere in between so again the lymphocytes would have the least site scatter monocyte more than that and neutrophil more than that eosinophil more than neutrophils so this is our second parameter so when we compare these two parameters if i compare the forward scatter on this remember forward scatter was directly proportional to the size so what i am going to get is the granulocytes towards the most right then next to it would be the monocytes and then next to it would be the lymphocytes had we not had this side scatter all three would have been in this same line so lymphocytes over here monocytes over here and neutrophils over here but now we have added a second parameter to it and that is the side scatter and as i told the granulocytes have more side scatter then comes the monocyte and the least is the lymphocyte so again we have this what are these cells so these are cells which have uh, the least forward scatter and the least side scatter that is they are smallest in size and least complex most likely these white cells that my arrow is pointing are the uh, red cell debris which usually we do not take into consideration so again the smallest and the least granular population monocytes the largest and the most granular uh, granular population the granulocytes and if we want to do more sorting then the lower half or the lower 80% are the granulocytes the upper one are the eosinophils here in between somewhere lies the monocytes so this is what we have got in a peripheral blood that we have differentiated lymphocytes monocytes neutrophils eosinophils do we need something more yes because we have to diagnose something we have to diagnose leukemias lymphomas we have to sort many 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 more cells now how do we do that so for example this is a population of so many people if i have a single parameter male female boy girl so for example so i have only two uh, only a single parameter in which i can sort this population i can add one more presence of a beard if i want to sort amongst the boys so i add a parameter of beard but this might not be suffice because i can very well see that there are so many different kinds of uh, uh, people in this entire population or if i say there are so many different kinds of cell in this that only differentiating it into two uh, or three cells is not sufficient for me so what i do is i add one more parameter maybe a color of the skin i add one more parameter maybe presence of spectacle or not so on and so forth and then i can actually by adding more and more and more parameters what i do is i can actually sort each and every person or cell in this sample now how do i do it so i had size with forward scatter complexity or granularity with side scatter the third thing which i have is the antigens present on the cell and these are the cd markers that we use now i am sure everybody of us in our pg times have been mugging up these but when you get into practice i can assure you need not uh, mug up you you know it by seeing the cells what uh, antigen is for what so practicing this becomes important and therefore i would like to uh, highlight here or emphasize here is that all the postgraduate students or the residents who are just go uh, 
starting uh, uh, the flow cytometers or cytometers or getting into it they must see more and more of reports they must see more and more of cases and they must do more and more of analysis once that is done i'm sure you need not mug up these and you will know it automatically i am not going into the details of the cd markers here because i have two more talks uh, most probably in the next month and there i would be dis discussing the applications of the uh, him um, flow cytometer in uh, um, hematology and there i'll be keep keeping on repeating these all again and again and therefore we can discuss it later but i am sure certain cd markers are very famous amongst the uh, the students and the residents and that would be a cd3 for t cell a cd20 cd19 for a b cell mpo for uh, myeloid cd45 as the leukocyte common antigen so these are cells which uh, we all know already and these are uh, the uh, cd markers which i would take this uh, forward so how do i uh, no whether yeah how do i come to know whether a cd marker is present on a cell or not for that what we do is we add a molecule which is known as a fluorochrome to this antibody so a antibody towards the antigen which is bound to a, a fluorosin molecule known as a fluorochrome is added to the sample now what exactly is the property or what is the fluorescence so whenever a light strikes a cell or a, a this fluorescent molecule it gets excited then it loses some energy and emits a light of another wavelength now how does this happen is i'll take you back to the electromagnetic spectrum that uh, we read in 11th 12th most probably in our higher secondary classes so two phenomenon that we must know here is one relation of wavelength with energy and frequency with energy so this is a rainbow violet indigo blue green yellow orange and red the wip gear beyond this is the ultraviolet area beyond this is the infrared area and as the wavelength goes on increasing frequency goes on decreasing and so does the energy so wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency and energy now i'll not talk of frequency anymore i'll talk only about wavelength and the energy so i excite a molecule with this wavelength that is somewhere around 480 which is in the blue spectrum it will release energy so release energy it goes to the right so it will emit energy in either green or yellow or orange or red never would it emit this color so this is one thing which we need to know that the emission of energy is always towards the right hand side so therefore you will always get a graph like this this here it gets excited at some wavelength and this is the peak of the excitation known as excitation maxima then it will release some energy and emit a wavelength of towards the right hand side and this is known as the emission maxima that is the maximum uh intensity that is the emission maxima the difference between absorption maxima and the emission maxima is known as the stoke shift now again not going into the details of stoke shift or absorption maxima emission maxima but these are helpful when we design the panels for our diagnosis of leukemia lymphoma etc but knowing what is stoke shift is important and knowing what is absorption maxima and emission maxima is what are different kinds of fluorochromes so again i would only emphasize on two or three which are most common and that is the fitc or the fluorocin isothiocyanide phycoerythrin or the pe per cp is one more which is that is peridinine chlorophyll protein if you see this 
excites at 488 nanometer that is our argon laser blue color light and it would emit at 518 nanometer that is in the green zone so absorbs blue light emits green light so th that is fit c this absorbs blue light pe emits somewhere into the orange red area now fluorochrome selection is also very important and it depends on the uh, number of antigen present on the cell how we uh, select the fluorochrome but again i'll come to selection of fluorochrome when i'll discuss panel designing in my next talks so today i'll move forward now these are our four uh, fit cp apc and per cp now forward scatter as the size was growing scatter was growing side scatter as the complexity was growing scatter was growing what happens over here as the number of antigens increases on the cell the intensity increases so a cell with less antigen or no antigen will be will have a dim signal a cell with moderate number of antigens will have a moderate signal and a cell with most number of antigens would have a bright signal so something similar to what we saw during the forward scatter a small cell a medium size cell and a large cell what it is a cell with no antigens a cell with moderate number of antigens a cell with the maximum number of antigens so similarly a histogram would be plotted so a brighter fluorescence would mean more number of antigens would be on the right hand side of this plot and these are the cells with no antigen or less number of antigens plotted on the left hand side if we see it into 2 2 into 2 plot that is pe on one and fit c on the other so remember last 2 into 2 plot was a forward scatter and a side scatter now here we have two fluorochrome emitting light fit c green and pe orange red so if we see these green cells these are cells which are positive for fit c that is any antibody that i bind to fit c the the antibody bound to fit c antigen was more number in these cells these cells have the antigen for the antibody bound to pe and what are these cells these are double positive cells that means these cells have both the antigens on their cell surfaces which uh, the fluorochrome pe was bound or the fit c was bound i'll clarify this in my further slides but before going to that we will just see what, how actually the optics work so for that we have three uh, kinds of different filters either it may be a filter or it may be a mirror the difference being filters would let the light pass and absorb rest of this the mirrors would reflect and uh, let the uh, light pass so not much of difference the important thing that uh, i would like to emphasize is that there are three kinds that is long pass short pass and band pass long pass for example this is lp500 so long pass means it will allow all the wavelengths more than 500 to pass through rest would not. short pass for example sp500 all the wavelengths less than 500 nanometers will pass through rest will not pass a band pass means a specific band so if i say 550 so a range of 50 nanometers that is 475 to 525 so this band pass filters will allow only 475 to 525 to pass through rest will get absorbed over here similarly there are these dichroic mirrors which are usually placed at a 45 degree and these would these have the same concept either this can be long pass or short pass or band pass but what they do is they reflect the light and allow the remaining light to go through so this is again the model which i had first shown you now i'll try to explain this with the fluidics and the optics so this is a laser 488 nanometer blue argon laser going through this this is our obscuration bar so that the negative uh, signals are not uh, going and hitting this pmts pmts again i'll uh, tell are the photo multiplier tubes which amplifies the 
um, photons that are hitting the uh, this detector. So basically, these are the detectors. Now, what happens is there is a cell in this interrogation pathway. According to the size, there would be some matter. Rest would be scattered in all the other direction. We are interested in this perpendicular uh, scatter. Here we have a mirror, 500 nanometer long pass. So it will allow all the wavelengths of more than 500 to pass to get reflected over here and we will get this signal coming to this PMT. Now what are these uh, less than 500 nanometers? So those are basically the blue light coming through side scatter. So what this PMT is detecting is the side scatter. Now this cell has all the uh, whatever antigens are present with the fluorochrome bound it will emit some kind of light and as i said it would be towards the right hand side so this will emit light definitely more than 488 nanometer so all those more than 500 will go over here here we have another mirror 640 nanometer short pass short pass short pass means it will allow all those bit less than 640 so 500 to 640 will pass through other will get reflected and go over here and here we can detect the far red signal from this 560 500 to 5, 640 there is another mirror 560 nanometer short pass all those cells all photons wavelength 500 to 560 will pass through rest will get reflected over here and we'll get some orange red signal over in this pmt Rest all the light going through is the green light which we can see on this FITC signal. So this is the basic model of how a optics uh, works in the flow cytometer. I have already told how a, a voltage or a plot is generated. So this cell when it is out of this interrogation point nothing is going through we have a flat line. As soon as it enters over here it will start giving out some photons or some scatter and when it is in the middle it gives the maximum intensity and then when it again passes through all stop so what does this imply so this is the time so it started from here and it went towards here what is this this is the maximum intensity of the photon striking the detector the area under the curve can also give you the same thing so the width gives you the time and the height gives you the intensity or the area gives you the intensity from the PMTs. Now from optics we go to electronics and in electronics this PMT in the older instrument it was all analog uh, amplification and analog amplification would then get digitalized and come to the computer. In the newer instruments the uh, digitalization takes place earlier why has this change been done because nowadays instead of a 8 bit or a 10 bit we have uh, more bytes so 2 to, 2 to the power 10 would give a less resolution than a 2 to the power 32 so therefore the digitalization takes place in this adcs at the very starting from the pmts and then this digital processing goes to my computer not much to, uh, this is the change which has brought about better resolution of the uh, events now all this goes into a list mode data and this is plotted onto the graph so basically sample goes in we label it with antibody attached to a fluorescent markers this gets activated, emits light, filtered and detected by PMTs. This goes on to give analog fluorescent signals which are converted to digital signals and it comes to the computer. So again, fluidics, optics, electronics, the most important part is the flow cell where you get the hydrodynamic because we want to interrogate one cell at a time. Once that happens, there is scatter in forward direction, in side rays direction, there is emission of fluorescence. All this comes and the data comes to the, uh, I'm extremely sorry for this. So all 
all this comes and get into the detector and this comes to my computer but there has to be a man behind the machine machine is not going to do everything for you and the doctors the technicians are the man behind the machine what we do is we process the sample and put it into the machine now this processing which i am going to talk is for the hematology lab only there are many other techniques of processing i'll not go into the details because i would be focusing on the hematological aspects of flow cytometry so the techniques that we use is stain lyse wash or the bulk lyse stain wash or the stain lyse and no wash now what is the stain so stain is adding antibody to the sample or adding the fluorochrome to the so if if uh, we are going to uh, have uh, for example a kappa lambda chain if you are going to uh, put antibodies again that it is advisable to do a previous wash and uh, to get better results this again i'll cover in my uh, next talks in which i actually uh, talk about the application part of the uh, flow cytometer but what samples are we going to get so in a routine hematopathology lab routinely you get the peripheral blood and the bone marrow apart from this the samples in which we can detect tumor cells are the cerebrospinal fluid the various serous effusions such as the pleural fluid the pericardial fluid or the ascitic fluid the vitreous fluid or the intraocular fluid so all uh, rarely tends to uh, go and metastasize into the inter intraocular area and so we get samples from the intraocular area so then the bronchialveolar lavage or the tissue biopsies now uh, the important point to note here is that the tissue biopsies are solid and therefore before processing it uh, before uh, putting it into any kind of process you need to put it make it into a suspension or a fluid because flow cytometry measures cells in a fluid so therefore tissue biopsies are teased and then they are brought into a fluid state and then we analyze into a flow cytometer what exactly in processing is stain so for example i want to sort a t cell from the lymphocytes and further i want to sort the cytotoxic t cell which has the cd8 and the helper t cell which has the cd4 so my antigens of interest would be cd3 also so i'll start by why cd45 it is a leukocyte common antigen so with cd45 i can get the lymphocytes from that i would try to get the cd3 sorted out cd3 are the t cells and from those cd3 t cells i'll try to sort out cd4 and cd8 so for this what i need to do is i want to first put the fluorochromes now i decide a panel and i link this anti cd3 with fit c this anti cd8 with pe anti cd45 with per cp anti cd4 with apc then the technicians puts all these stains into the sample this fluorochromes and the anti cd3 or anti cd45 cd8 cd4 all gets bound to this antigen so this is my staining step i incubate it for 15 minutes in dark so everything is going to happen in dark why in dark because these are fluorescent molecules so if i do it in light they might get excited and then they would emit some energy uh, uh, lose some energy and emit the light so that i don't want before it goes into a flow cytometer so therefore most of the process we do it in the dark next come the uh, lysis and the wash this again there are two modes one is the tube lysis that is i do the lysis in individual tubes or i can do a bulk lysis that is i take the entire sample and i lyse it first and then i put the remaining pallet into the different different tubes so there are two methods as i have already earlier told that is stain lyse and wash or bulk lyses stain and wash now it depends on what exactly are we analyzing it depends from lab to lab which methods are better 
and there are uh, there is a good paper uh, on this lysing method from iccs and it has given this tabulated forms of pros and cons for both it also tells most of the things about lysing but what we need to know here is tube lysis would give us the best signal discrimination and bed separation of populations but as there are different different tubes differently lysis is happening so there would be an inconsistency in the percentage of cells in various tubes also there would be increased cell loss and more debris in bulk lysis what we do is we take the entire sample and we lyse it so we get lots of wbc pellet in the bottom and this we can use in multiple tubes so for example i have done four tubes analyzing 4 into 4 16 parameters i have analyzed and then i feel i want to do more for then i can take that pellet as well so there is leftover suspension for add ons also and as the entire bulk is lies i can use this for more number of events or large number of events which is usually done in the uh, when we have to detect some rare events but it uses more reagents therefore is more costly and there are certain studies which says that it alters the lymphocyte subset subsets also activates monocyte so it is entirely the choice of the lab which methods would they prefer tube lysis or bulk lysis or for what kind of analysis what kind of technique they have to use but those should be protocol based should be standardized in the lab washing is nothing but the excess antibodies that we have put should not interfere with uh, the uh, fluorescence activity and are should not give us false positive uh, results so therefore we must uh, do the washing the care that must be taken during that is should be minimum cell loss and maximum removal of free antibodies now once i have processed this i put this into the machine now when i put into the machine there are two or three things which i need to take care during the acquisition acquisition is what the sample is going through the flow cell the laser is hitting the cells and the graphs are being generated so during that time i need to take care one is of flow rate if my flow rate is very high then there are chances that two or three cells would go together if my flow rate is very low and if i am going to count lots and lots of events it will take lot of time so therefore i need to judge the uh, flow rate accordingly so initially it might be a low flow rate but if i see that the uh, resolution is getting good i would go with a moderate to higher flow rate the second important thing is to put a discriminator so for example when i showed you the forward scatter to side scatter graph i had shown certain cells over here which were the cellular debris so i need to set a discriminator so for example i set a discriminator before this cells all the cells would be included in my events which i don't want these are debris i don't want it in my analysis if i put a discriminator towards more towards the right then maybe my lymphocytes would get uh, deleted from my analysis so therefore it is important to put a threshold at the proper point and then you get the uh, correct number of uh, cells to analyze third is you can always have a pre prepared templates and the cells uh, uh, the uh, these these templates helps us in uh, sorting of the cells then comes the analysis so once you have got all the graphs this is one of the most important parts and here lies in all the skill of a hematopathologist uh, if i should say so but one thing which is before analyzing we must know the counts well and also if possible we should have a pbs or if a bone marrow sample is there a bone marrow morphology examination with us preferably the one the person who is analyzing should himself uh look into the slides if not possible then at least he must have a morphology report with him because it is an integrated process of morphology with flow cytometry and without a uh, morphology it becomes very tough to uh, analyze in many cases now i'll quickly run through how we do it because this is what i will be focusing in my next talk so here first we do a side scatter for forward scatter and a uh, so we get all what we have the singlet discrimination we do it along the time 
Now next is the forward scatter and side scatter. As I had earlier told, these are the lymphocytes, the monocytes and the polymorphonuclear cells or the granulocytes. If I want, if I take the same example forward, I want to differentiate my CD3 with CD4 and 8. Not only that, now I have put two more antibodies or three more antibodies in this. The, those are CD56, CD19, CD14 and CD16. So what I do is I get from here. So this is a CD3 side scatter plot. As I have told, brighter CD3 would be on the right hand side. Dimmer CD3 would be on the left hand side. Brighter CD3 that means they have more number of CD3 antigen present. Dimmer means they have less number or absent CD3. So brighter CD3 are the T cells. The dimmer are the non T cells. So from here I get this CD. What do you mean by get? So I now in the next plot I will take only this CD3. I am not going to analyze this. From these T cells I put a CD4 is to 8 and all these cells those are only positive for CD4 these cells which are only positive for CD8 few events over here which are positive for both CD4 and 8 so this is a CD4 positive T cell this is a CD8 positive T cell what else do I have I have a CD56 so these are the CD56 positive T cells which we call as NK T cells now what are these non T cells these are lymphocytes so non-T cell lymphocyte means they are the B cells and so I get this CD19 positive B cells. Along with this, if I analyze this monocyte gate with these, then if putting 14, 16, I can get the monocytes also. So this was just an example of how we proceed with our analysis, which I'll again, as I am always been saying that in my next talks, that would be my more uh, emphasizing point and I would try to make more clear about things in that talk. So single parameter analysis is a histogram I have already uh, told. A two parameter analysis can be a dot plot which is the most commonly used plots. It can be a contour plot. So these are the cell lines and the most in uh, again a color density plot. So depending on the intensity you get more uh, dense plots but the most commonly used plots are the dot plot plots dot plots or the contour plots so in short what are we analyzing we are analyzing the physical properties forward scatter is size side scatter is granularity then we are analyzing the antigenic properties so this antigenic i missed out to first uh, emphasize on this that these antigens are not only present on the surface but they may also be present in the cytoplasm and the uh, nucleus and for this uh, during processing we add in one more step and that is put, to put this antibody inside we create certain gaps in the membrane by using saponin mostly and that would help us help the uh, fluorochromes or the antibodies to get inside the cell and stain the cytoplasmic antigens and the nuclear antigens. So we have the physical properties, the antigenic properties and on basis of that we characterize the cell. So these are all labeled with CD3, CD8, CD4 molecules based on the side scatters on the forward scatter and the CD348 we have differentiated between CD4, CD8 cells. So this is how the entire analysis takes place. This is a normal bone marrow, the beautiful picture showing almost all kinds of cell that we can have in a normal marrow, the NRBCs, the CD34 B cell precursors, the CD34 positive B cell precursors, the mature lymphocyte, the monocytes, the monocytic dendritic cells, the plasmacytic dendritic cells, the mature neutrophils, the immature granulocytes or the myelocytes, metamyelocytes, monocytes and the eosinophils. Now, this is something which is very important that we analyze normal bone marrows, normal peripheral blood smear, only then we would be able to see what is abnormal. So therefore, uh, the pathology residents who are lucky enough to have filters in their institutes, I would uh, urge them to see as many as normal peripheral bloods, as many as normal bone marrows into a flow cytometer. Now normal bone marrows means you would get regenerating bone marrows 
or the uh, marrows from the lymphoma patients coming for uh, staging purpose you can always run those on the uh, flow cytometer and see what different kinds of cells you are getting try to analyze those based on the various markers that you can put in coming to the last part of my talk that is the quality control in flow cytometer so there are three phases as we all know the pre analytical phase analytical and the post analytical so potential pre analytical errors are cellularity so for example fna or a csa or a hypoplastic bone marrow will give you very less cells and uh, in these less cellularity samples it becomes very difficult to um, uh, make much of any analysis then plasma cells are fragile cells which would degenerate very quickly there can be a necrosis you can have plasma cell loss you can have autolysis or age so therefore we sample as soon as possible or there can be a antigen loss because of again time or the fixation issues during analysis we have certain methods to see whether really we are doing proper analysis or not so first is the internal quality control the living jennings graph uh, which are standard in all the instruments that we use similarly we can do it with the uh, with our flow cytometers also the next three or four i'll discuss a bit in detail so fluorescence control what is this auto fluorescence so as i said that a blue light comes strikes this is if there is a fluorescent molecule over it um, it emits a green light but when this blue light comes the innate property of the cell might be to emit some light and that can cause a background fluorescence so therefore you always must know what is the background fluorescence of a of a cell in a particular channel and therefore we always run a blank tube which acts like a negative control next is the uh, isotype controls which are no longer recommended fluorescence minus 1 should be done for all the uh, fluorochromes what is fluorescence minus 1 so for example i had shown that fit c is cd3 the other three had cd4 8 and 45 what i do is i do not put cd3 i put only cd45 cd8 and cd4 and then try to see how much fluorescence is coming from fit c into all these three channels and so on and so forth so therefore i can know how much of fluorescence is coming from the other channels then you have to check for the viability so viability you have pi or the uh, 7 aad dyes these go and bind to the uh, dna and then the fluorescence and you can get certain signals but these are dyes in these dye would enter only a dead cell so all those which are null cells all those which are positive are actually the dead cells so you have to analyze on the cells which are viable that are negative cells next is the antibody titration which is very very important so the manufacturer would say that you have to use a 10 microliter of antibody but then it is important for every lab to titrate it so serial dilution 10 5 2.5 1.25 1. microliters see what is optimal concentration that saturates all the available sites thereby avoiding the presence of false positive due to excess monoclonal antibodies into the sample then background noise i have talked of much and the best control which i feel during analysis is a normal cell from the sample so for example a monocyte has a cd4 antigen so if i want to check whether my cd4 has worked or not i should look for the monocytes a neutrophil has a cd10 antigen so if i want to check whether my cd10 has worked or not i must look whether cd10 is positive in neutrophils or not so for me the best is the positive control but you always don't have a positive control and therefore you must know what is the negative cut off and what is the positive which you have to say then there are post analytical quality controls so uh, there is interpretation of analysis which is very important your diagnosis your follow up you should correlate it clinically you should correlate it call with your morphology in this way you can uh, have a correlation telling you that yes your uh, analysis is correct you have to check there are no clerical errors during typing of report and 
a lab must always participate in an interlaboratory comparison or equas what is the current scenario in flow cytometry so you may be remembering these nokia phones which we had around 10 12 years ago we have progressed to better phones why because we wanted higher resolution and same is the scenario with our flow cytometers it has benefited from the technological developments of monoclonal antibodies the fluorochromes the computers are like playstations nowadays and as i told only argon laser to have more number of lasers more number of lasers means you can have more number of parameters so instead of only four parameters i can go on to six to eight the latest you have 32 parameters with five lasers so this is something which advance with advancement the current scenario of flow cytometry you can get more and more numbers of giving you opportunity to sort more and more number of cell also what has happened is that artificial intelligence has taken over now processing can be done in an automated way you can load the sample in an automated way you can analyze the sample in an automated way i'll present an example after two three slides but one thing is multi parameter information at single cell levels you are now able to detect rare events and therefore the follow up Uh, of the uh, leukemia for example in the measurable residual disease has become possible and you can rapidly analyze large number of cells but with these advances comes uh, some challenges and uh, there is a compensation issue again i will not go into the details of compensation i'll just uh, say that for example this is a fit c this is a p channel you see that there is a spectral overlap so my fit c is going to go and hit in the p channel also so i am going to get fit c signal not only from the fit c detector but also from the p detector but i don't want it from the p detector so i do some mathematical calculations and i remove this so these signals are coming into the p e detector which i don't want and therefore i do some mathematical calculation i calculate the percentage spillover i put my negative threshold or i change this uh, intensity according to the mean fluorescence and i get the correct picture so this fit c double positive population it was only a single fit c positive population because but because of certain fit c cells going uh, uh, certain fit c wavelength going and hitting the p channel i was getting these signals over here which now come down and i get the actual signals see the, the, this compensation is bit complicated and this would take an entire half an hour to 45 minutes to actually understand and to go through i might not have been able to uh, make you understand it so e because it is not easy in one or two slides but yes compensation is something which you need to uh, <coughs> correct uh, before analyzing the advantage is now that we have is that the compensation matrices are already present in the latest uh, flow cytometer software analyzers and we need not do much uh, regarding these so when i uh, i had an opportunity to go to spain to this uh, lamanca where i gained a lot and i learned a lot so this is one of the cases now this is a plot in which there is no gating or uh, we have not uh, yet classified the cells why i have put this here is with this software what you can do is i click on uh, this button then i click on this button for automated gating and identification i just click over here i check everything is correct or not i go to okay wait for 10 to 15 seconds and what do i get is everything is gated classified by the software not only that it has given me the number of events for lymphocytes for b cells t cells cd34 myeloid precursor monocyte neutrophil or everything has been classified with number of events moreover it generates a reports and give so this is something which is latest advancement with artificial intelligence but understanding basics was important before reaching over here and therefore 
could put in some insights on the basics of the flow cytometry, the dynamics of and the quality control part of it. Next to talk the application that would be more interesting, I can assure you this was kind of, I won't say boring, but uh, more of a theoretical aspect, but was important to know. So these are the various applications. Yes, the most important is diagnosis for proliferative disorders and leukemias, but then there are so many other uh, applications of flow cytometer, not only in hematopathology, in other uh, um, areas also, which we will be discussing in the last uh, next two uh, talks. Uh, to conclude, what I would like to say is, it is not only about uh, the machine and the man, you have to be alert at each and every step. You have to check the sample integrity. Your machine should be working fine with all the quality controls in place. You must have the best software as well. You must have a standard operating procedure for each and every step. Panels must be designed in an optimal way to give the best from the least. You must participate in some ILC or uh, uh, external quality assurance program. And of course, you must have skilled technicians and skilled doctors to give out the best reports and help the most in the patient care. So this is uh, Tata Medical Center which, where I gained my entire hematopathology experience in the past two years. Past, uh, then during that I had an opportunity to go to University of Salamanca, Spain where I learned on experience actually analyzing things and getting more insights into leukemias, lymphomas, the MRDs, the lymphocyte subsets. And this is Suraksha Diagnostic Center where I am working at present. I have developed the flow cytometry over here in the past 6 to 8 months and we are ready to go with more and more samples coming in. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my uh, mail address if at all anybody has to post any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Dr. Gautam Bhagwat. Excellent presentation. You went at a very nice pace and you explained the, as well as the dynamics of this complicated machine flow cytometry which started as a very simple very single line you know process way back in 1992 I did my thesis on flow cytometry <laughs> and now you can imagine about 30 years down the line the entire instrument its, it's look has changed and it's now a very complex instrument but the basics still remains there and really one needs to understand every bit of it the way it works, the way it operates, the way it needs to be managed and the quality part of it and of course the compensation part nowadays we have software which manages the compensation on its own so you don't need to do any compensation ex externally developing and as the amount of money you put in the better quality flow cytometer you bring in the the more better the artificial intelligence software you, you put in the, the input from the human aspect is becoming less and less but end of the day, it is not the printout which matters. It is the analytical mind of the man who has to sit down and look at it and decide whether to accept it or not to accept it or how much to impo give importance to that. An extraordinary presentation, I would say. Very nicely done. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Just hold on. If I Let me yes. see if there are any questions on the YouTube. <coughs> Everybody will be waiting for the application part because that is the one which is more exciting. Yes. These are the ones, you know, which nobody wants to know, but these are the important things because if you don't know the basics, then you will be caught up somewhere. In fact, when you analyze the samples in day-to-day -day life, you uh, come to understand the importance of all this. Maybe uh, when we start our hematopathology career, we are least interested in all these things and we only go to analysis, how to diagnose, how to do that. But once you get experience, this becomes important because it affects your analysis. If you don't know what is compensation, you might wrongly label something as positive. Although it is just because of the compensation that it has gone into the positive area of it. So these are things which are very, very important. Processing the samples as the PG students and the residents are listening to this talk, I would urge them to actually process the samples because uh, you get to know a lot of things uh, once you process it within, with your hands, once you analyze it yourself, play with the graphs, understand it. Absolutely right. 
absolutely right. I mean, if you do not understand the ABC of the instrument, you 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 will be sometime you will be caught. Yes. You really need to understand the ABC, the basics, how it works, what is the what is the way how to function, where are the limitations. After all, there are a lot of limitations in every aspect, and uh, that we have to understand. Uh, there are no questions on the YouTube, Dr. Gautam Bhagwat. Excellent presentation. Thank you very we much. would love to have you back uh, with the application session two well, and, and the application session the three. Interest. That would be much more interesting because yes. that is exactly where everybody is trying to put their money in. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, right. Uh, uh, please share the PDF of this talk. Sure. So sure. that we can upload it on the on the Google Drive which we have. Thank you so much. God bless you. Good night. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye bye. Bye.